Oh, Welcome okay. to another episode of Preparing for the Unexpected. I'm your host, Alex Fullick, and as always, we like to talk about things related to disaster recovery, business continuity, resilience, COVID, crisis management, anything that's relatable to those topics. Speaking of topics, if there's something you'd like us to touch on or you'd like to be a guest on the show, please feel free to reach out through LinkedIn. You can find me there. I'm the <laughs> only Alex Fullick on LinkedIn, so I'm really easy to find, and I do respond to everything I get. A couple of quick announcements. I'm going to be speaking at a few conferences this year at the end of the year. Uh, the first one in October is Continuity Insights, October 4th to 6th in Minneapolis. Fingers crossed we can travel then. Uh, the second one is BCI World Virtual, uh, November 3rd to 4th. And the last one is the Continuity and Resilience Today Conference in Toronto, which I better be able to trans, uh, travel for since it's just down the road for me, December 1st and 2nd. Other than that, I want to welcome our regular guest. He's been here a lot, and it's that time again for this week in business continuity with James Green. James, welcome back. Thanks, Alex. How are you? Good. Uh, as I said before we started recording, it's hot here. Really hot. <laughs> uh, so I will be at Continuity Insights in Minneapolis with you as well. Hopefully you're allowed to cross the border. And then I will be at BCI World virtually with you uh, again for the second year in a row. Not not continuity and resilience today. I thought I'd leave you alone maybe once, but the rest of it, I hope to see you. Yeah, I, I, every conference I, I tend to go to or speak at or just attend, I, I seem to be running into you all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay, that's good, it's good. <laughs> so I know we've got a few things to uh, touch on today. Um, mm -hmm. And I know we've got a few things we added uh, before we started recording. But let's jump into our first uh, topic, the uh, ransomware in Colonial Pipeline. What are your thoughts on that one? I have a lot of thoughts. We can start with factual or I have tinfoil hat thoughts. Which way? Uh, I'm all over the map on this one. Maybe we start with factual. Yeah. Uh, so the day that we recorded this, it was announced that the initial entry into Colonial Pipeline's system was a decommissioned VPN that nobody was using that they forgot to shut down. Hmm. So, so think about that. You have a legacy system and we see this all the time in business continuity, right? When we do BIAs and someone mm -hmm. says, oh, well, we use a, you know, this is almost like the opposite of shadow IT. You have shadow IT where departments are using systems and technology that nobody has an idea of. This to me is the reverse of that, where a company said, hey, you know, we, we've migrated to a new VPN. We decommissioned it, but we didn't turn it off. Huh. How crazy is that? that, that that's crazy. Well, it reminds me of, um, I don't know if you've run into this, but a, a company that will migrate to a new system or application or whatever the case may be. And because one person that's been there for a long time, usually an executive who doesn't want to learn the new one, keeps the old one running and it becomes vulnerable after a while. And that seems to be exactly what happened here. Yeah, I bet, exactly. I bet you it might, might have been a combination of we forgot to do it and somebody was still using it because they didn't want to change. I used to work at a company where there was one executive, and this is in the last 10 years, so do the math on my LinkedIn if you'd like to. There was one executive who used the BlackBerry. So we had to support one person using one device. And I like your analogy of maybe there was one person using that, that VPN, but think about what that did, not only to that company, but to the spotlight, ransomware, US Russian relations, all of that touched off by uh, a decommissioned VPN. And I, I would be very curious, I bet someone on a BIA somewhere knew that VPN was still bouncing around their their architecture. Well, it's that and it affected tens of millions of people in the end, you know, with the downstream impacts. But mm -hmm. it make, with the BIA, why wasn't it followed up? If it is on a BIA, why wasn't it followed up and addressed? Two, if it's not on a BIA, why didn't it get addressed? Because that meant there's still something there that wasn't identified. One way or another, somebody ignored it. 
Exactly. So if one of your audience has the smoking gun BIA, send it into Alex. We'll be happy <laughs> to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. But you know, one thing that I've been thinking about Colonial Pipeline, not just from a ransomware perspective, but again, from a crisis management perspective, Colonial Pipeline made the decision to shut down their own systems. Like a lot of people think that everything was encrypted by ransomware, but it was actually their billing system. And they said, hey, without our billing system, we can't log what customers are using. We can't bill our customers. So two interesting things popped out there. First, they had no BC plan for their billing system. Mm -hmm, yeah. And then when they shut it down, they created a secondary crisis where you had five states in the United States now couldn't get access to gasoline because they, they shut their systems down. I thought that was really interesting, kind of pulling a thread. And we see that often with any type of crisis where something small happens or something over here happens, but the lasting consequence, the major problem is over here. So we have a billing system that's encrypted with ransomware. We have no business continuity plan for the billing system. We say, hey, shut the whole company down. And now five states in the US, you know, their gas stations run dry. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I, I like your comment, you know, for sometimes the little things create the big impacts. You know, what's that saying? Um, from uh, little acorns, do mighty oaks grow? You know, well, <laughs> this was one of those situations. What were your thoughts that they went ahead and paid that for, was it four million? Four million ransom. When yeah. I've talked to so many people and the majority, and you hear government officials, everything say, don't pay, don't pay, don't pay. Correct. The FBI, the United States FBI will tell you, don't pay. Governments around the world will tell you, don't engage with terrorists. But companies have been paying and they've been paying for years. And the reason I know this is, and we've talked about this before, criminals, especially financial criminals, are in the business of making money. And the fact that ransomware keeps getting more and more sophisticated means people are paying it. If you had ransomware that you developed and deployed and nobody paid for it, you would stop. And especially in this case, uh, the way this program worked, DarkSide, it's actually an affiliate program. So you have a group of developers and they license this out. So if you're an affiliate and you convince someone to pay ransomware, the affiliate gets 85%, the dev team gets 15%. So I'm not surprised that uh, Colonial Pipeline paid it because what are the options? I understand in Blue Sky or in a crisis management exercise, we say don't pay ransomware. But if you're the CEO of a multi-billion dollar company and I say, hey, Alex, we can't bill our customers maybe forever, you're going to pay it. You're going to pay it because the board's going to fire you and fire everybody and we're going to go out of business. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I'm not surprised that they've paid it because people have been paying and, 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 you know, it's kind of a, it's a dangerous circle because that four, that $4 million means other people will, you know, have to pay it or it'll become more sophisticated one thing that I think is really interesting, and this is where I could get my tinfoil hat on, <laughs> is the FBI found the private key for about 85% of the ransomware, which is the exact same fee structure that the affiliates have. Uh, I find it really interesting that one, the FBI was publicly involved. They've been involved behind the scenes in a lot of situations but their official statement is that they found the private key, which is, you know, the way to access this money. Now, certainly you don't find a private key for, for Bitcoin at a Chinese restaurant in a fortune cookie on, on the floor. Um, so I'm really curious your take about that. And I think it's going to change a lot of things going forward. Um Partly, I'm thinking the FBI might have said something this time as a try to be, I don't know how successful, but try to be a bit of a deterrent to those who want to try this. It's like, look, 
see, we have found something. We do have some tools now that can track you down, that can get our money back, can fix things or can investigate. You know, we, we, we're not as defenseless as we might have been before. Now, that does, that's not speaking for organizations. That's just FBI saying that. Yeah. And this is where my, my tinfoil hat. Now I wish I had some tinfoil to wrap around my head at this point. Um, I wonder, I speculate, this is no inside information here. My personal opinion, I think the FBI had some help from Russia. And the reason I say this is most of these threat actors, most of these ransomware groups operate in Russia right? They operate um, with no risk and kind of the unspoken agreement has been they don't target Russian anything, right? And they try to keep things off the radar. There's been a lot of ransomware the last two or three years that has inconvenienced organizations, but the Colonial Pipeline was the first one that was a huge problem for tens of millions or millions of Americans. And I would think the Russians would not uh, want that kind of heat to come back to them. You know, this was the first one there where you had lines at gas stations, you had people's cars run out of gas. Like it wasn't life threatening, but mm -hmm. it, was, it was dramatic. And it, it kind of reminded me of in a way, the data breach at Target, the retailer Target, there had been a lot of data breaches before Target, but especially in, in the US, Target was the first one where it made mainstream media, your average consumer now understood why a data breach was a problem. And I feel it's very similar for Colonial Pipeline where it went from this abstract or esoteric Thing, or I don't know, to now I, I live in Charlotte and I can't get gas. And I'll always wonder, it'll be curious, maybe we'll find out in 50 years from now that, like you said, was the U.S., did was it just the first time, you know, with the help of the NSA, we went on the offensive to deter hmm. future criminals? Or was there concern from the side of the Russians that, hey, this spotlight's a little too bright now, and now we're going to punish those threat actors for the first time as a warning going forward, stay away from things that become geopolitical. So that's my yeah. kind of tinfoil uh, conspiracy thought that I think our, the U S government had uh, my personal opinion, maybe that they had some assistance because the timing of how fast things happen that have never happened before yeah. it is rather interesting to me. Well, a couple of days later, after the Colonial Pipeline, there was, uh, oh, I'm going to forget the name wrong, CSF Foods, which was yep. one of the largest, if not the largest, meat packers in uh, the United States. Correct. Also had a ransomware attack right afterwards. And to me, that seems uh, as though um, the focus from uh, all these hackers that are out there, instead of going for uh, some of the corporate clients, you know, banks and things like that, they're, they're changing to infrastructure. Because <clears throat> fuel and energy is obviously a, a, a key piece. Food is another key piece. So, and I think that kind of maps back a little bit too. Maybe I need a uh, foil hat. <laughs> but may, that kind of maps back a little bit to what you said, you know, that it got investigated really quick. And right after the meatpacking one, that seemed to have disappeared rather quickly as well. Yes, it did. Yeah, I, I certainly think threat actors, maybe initially you saw your first go around targeting financial services firms because they had money. The mm -hmm. second round seemed to be healthcare because of, you know, in the US, HIPAA and privacy and PII laws, those healthcare organizations cannot lose control of patient data. But now I think you're starting to see this third tranche of organizations that have large amounts of data that may not have sophisticated security or risk management structures, such as a pipeline, such as uh, a large meat processing company. These are not industries that you would think of as technologically sophisticated, and I think they need to be. Do you think maybe it's because those uh, 
those organizations tended to focus on um, making sure pipelines were secure, um, terrorism, mm -hmm. sabotage, things like that, earthquakes, you know, fires, floods, rather than the cyber world. Yeah, it was it was probably a risk that was low probability to them. Just like two years ago, everyone thought a pandemic was low probability. So why focus on that? And now we saw how that turned out for everyone. Yeah. Well, on that note, we've come to the end of our first segment. We are talking with James Green today, this week in business continuity. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We are talking with James Green today, this week in business continuity. James, let's move on to a recent survey uh, that was done here in Canada. Uh, you, you brought it to my attention. I actually didn't see it, uh, surprisingly enough, but you brought it to my attention, uh, something that was done with regards to um, business continuity since the start of COVID and how businesses uh, perceive our industry and practices overall. Yeah, so I'm, anytime I can find something about Canadian business continuity that you haven't seen, I'm excited. So I'm glad I could find something. <laughs> so first on-site property restoration released a survey of Canadian businesses about business interruptions. And not surprisingly, four in five Canadian businesses have, have had some type of interruption over the past five years. And initially you're thinking, well, duh, five out of five experienced COVID. So mm -hmm. is that even telling us something? But when you and I started to uh, dig into the numbers, so certainly 77% experienced a disruption yep. because of a pandemic, obviously. But then I started to look at the percentage of all these other things, 45% of interruptions due to communication outages, 43% due to winter storms. You have a lot of other areas where I feel over the last two years, these organizations have had compounding issues, right? You've had a pandemic and then you had telecom outage. You had a pandemic and then you had a winter storm. And I wonder, uh, the first thing is, you know, I always talk about the next bump in the night. And I really think that all these organizations are going to be hyper-focused on pandemic response for the next two years. But now I'm starting to wonder, and you and I have spoken about it earlier with work from home, how are organizations, especially small to medium businesses, going to be able to handle those compounding events? So now you have two or three things happening at the same time. I'm not sure a lot of businesses can, especially the small and medium ones, because one, they don't have the resources, uh, and I mean financial and physical, but yeah. they also don't have the personnel to be able to do that. So often they have to take this approach. Let's deal with one problem at a time, try to take a step forward and then add to it. So for them, it's going to take a longer time to get this full robust program response uh, and preparedness uh, mechanisms in place, which is a shame. And at the same time, because now we're seeing variants with COVID new ones coming out where, yeah. where it appears the actual variants are merging, <laughs> not just the original and a variant, but now two variants merging to create a third. That's going to be ongoing. You mentioned the work at home. There are surveys that are coming out. Um, I'm not sure if I meant if we touched on this last month or not, but up to here in Canada, up to 40% uh, or more are considering changing their jobs or they want to change in their working conditions, meaning some yep. sort of hybrid approach, you add all of that in. And it seems uh, for a lot of small and well, actually, you know, even large companies, all of this is going to be difficult to manage while still under the umbrella of the pandemic, which is looks like it might, hopefully not, might change things again. So uh, I actually wrote a question because I was hoping we'd come close to this. Uh, so I just wanted to get your thoughts on this is, will our response and uh, plans and our the skill level we need to know in business continuity or risk management be larger than we can actually manage ourselves? Because now we're looking at cyber information security. We've got all the natural disasters, you know, the man-made disasters. We've got pandemics. We And now we've got combinations of all of them occurring. Are we getting to a point where how, you know, even we might start questioning how do we manage this ourselves? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of us have spoken for years about the needs to break down silos between <clears throat> different aspects of risk management or vendor risk or cyber. And that's mostly been an academic exercise. But to your point, that's reality. Now, you may have an organization that's dealing with COVID while dealing with a cyber incident, while dealing with a wildfire. You can't expect one business continuity or risk management professional to be a deep dive expert in all of that and manage all of that. So I think we're going to see more true um, you know, crisis management type teams and team frameworks because things are getting so crazy right now. It can't scale with an individual contributor or a small team that's nuanced in one thing. It's just, not, it's not going to work. Well, and the, the report that you, or the survey, I should say, from uh, first onsite property restoration, 77% interrupt, um, interruptions from pandemic, 45 interruptions from communication outages, which there's quite a few things that can have to fall under that umbrella. Yeah. Um, winter storms, of course, and we share that with uh, the northern U.S., northeastern U.S., of course. Um, we all share that same pain. Uh, 23% of flooding, one in five uh, windstorms and hurricanes. And uh, I can tell you most of that, we're guaranteed it's from our, our friends in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick and Newfoundland and Prince Edward Island who unfortunately, just like Maine and New Hampshire and all those states down there, every winter and hurricane season just get hit terribly. Yes. You know, and it seems to be actually more and more each year, the storm seems to be getting uh, more destructive and impactful. But even some of these other results here, that um, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten different uh, areas where respondents had concerns uh, about, and easily over half half of them are well over fifty percent of their concerns. Yeah. So to to the point of, I can't deal with everything. You know, how is one person in these small and medium um, businesses going to be able to manage that? Do you think maybe executives need to step up more or we need to really take uh, a stronger uh, approach across the board rather than just pigeonholing business continuity into one little area? Yeah, I think I think there needs to be more investment in the term resilience. So especially, mm -hmm. like you said, on, on, on the coast of Canada and the coast of the United States, areas that get hit real often by hurricanes, have these public-private partnerships where, you know, the federal government, the state government, the local government, big business, small business, they all come together because they recognize if a community is wiped out, no one can live or work here. And you see that around natural res uh, disasters and coastal resilience is a very familiar term, but I think it's going to have to evolve to community resilience where if three you know, key companies or a small nonprofit get hit by ransomware or a fire or a flood or all of the above, how are we going to, are we just going to tell those people leave the community or we don't need you anymore? I think it's, it's going to have to be bigger than any one company, especially in the small to medium business. Uh, I think in the United States, 80% of people are employed in small or medium businesses. They're a huge part of the economy. And we're going to have to build these coalitions to help. Uh, there's no way even the largest companies in the world can manage all of this. So how are we expecting even a company with 100, 200 employees to be able to be masters of the risk management universe? I don't think it's, it's just not going to work. Well, I'm, I'm not the first to say this. I know many others have said it, but resilient people create resilient organizations. So I, I don't think it's, for, for us, I don't think we just need to think of our processes need to be resilient. We have to take a step back and go into people that develop these have to be the people that manage them, the people that prepare, people that respond, the people that lead. All of them have to be resilient. If you've got a CEO who's not resilient, you know, scatterbrained or whatever, but very smart in what they do. Yeah. You know, <laughs> they're not going to help the organization, no matter how smart they are, become resilient because exactly. they can't see beyond the bottom line. You know, you know, and again, with multiple situations, uh, I do recall a situation a couple of years ago where the UK had heavy rains and um, uh, I believe it was in the middle of England, uh, the Midlands were flooding all over the place uh, because they had England of all places 
was complaining about the rain, <laughs> you know, that there was too much and they couldn't handle it. And one of the organizations um, was also managing a snowstorm on the East Coast uh, of uh, the U.S. and Canada at the same time, you know, uh, and that's before COVID. And there are still snowstorms occurring and rainstorms occurring. Now you add pandemic on that. And, you know, that's got to be tough for anyone in the industry. Exactly. All of those other incidents that we are used to managing, fires, floods, winter storms, those have still, they didn't stop. Mm -hmm two years and they're not going to stop. So all of those are happening, like you said, while there's now pandemics, while there's uh, ransomware and, and information security problems. You mentioned before we went on the air about an active shooter incident. There's these things just stacking up. Yeah. Uh, and, and people need to, like you said, be personally resilient so that their organizations can be resilient. So whatever that next bump in the night is, like I like to call it, whatever happens, yeah. they can respond to it. Aliens landing or who knows what we'll be talking about in six months. So I'm getting concerned. You're, you're referencing metal hats and aliens quite a bit here. <laughs> I've got a theme. <laughs> you, got, got you got a theme going. <laughs> okay. So let's jump to the, the next one we were going to talk about, which is the business continuity and resilience a generational perspective report that uh, came out a little while ago. Um, there were some really interesting findings in here. Um, what were your, your thoughts, first of all? Yeah, so I, I pulled a few charts out. I always love reports like this. Uh, I am do you, want a big to share, do you want to share a screen? I've given you permission. No, well, I'm going to, I'm going to quiz you on some stuff. We'll talk about, uh -huh. um, but I think, I think the BCI North America practice group, I really like their papers because let's be honest, there's a lot of white papers out there about our industry. And how often do you read the whole thing? Or after page five, you're thinking, oh, there's nothing new here. Or the survey mm -hmm. data is strange. This one I found really interesting because like you, I'm, I'm the forgotten generation, Gen X. Everyone talks about you know, boomers and Y and millennial and Z. And I'm like, hey, well, there's a big chunk of us uh, in between. Um, and there's some things here that that jumped out to me that make me wonder or should I worry about the future of our our profession. So I thought it was interesting that, you know, the percentage of baby boomers and Gen X in in our profession is almost 85 percent. That's one that jumped out to me too. And I was shocked going, oh my God, that's incredible because we've already got baby boomers retiring. Yeah. And, and if by chance uh, a Gen Xer, you know, won the lottery or something, some of them are leaving. Yeah. So you have 2% of the silent generation. So born before 1945 involved in the profession, but only 1% of Gen Z born after 1995 and then only 15% of Gen Y. So we have a very old profession. Mm -hmm. And um, like, is that, do you find that sustainable? Where are we, you know, who's gonna be running the ship in 10, 15 years and without having younger people who are, every generation is, is familiar with different technology, different tools, different systems, if we're not pulling that into our profession and as cyber security becomes a bigger risk management and business continuity issue, I wonder if we just have a myopic view of, of large swaths of, of emerging risk. We do right now because we will have so many people leaving over time and they take not just their knowledge, but their experiences. You know, their own personal experiences. I worked at a client who this happened. And those are the key stories that really help a lot of other people. On the flip side, there's in the back of the, let me see, the, another prop, the uh, BCM compensation report is a list mm -hmm. of uh, certifications in the industry now that uh, even five years ago, half of them probably weren't even there. Yeah. So I'm seeing, even though we do have this risk of a lot of people leaving, you know, either retirement or just want to change jobs because of the pandemic, you know, whatever the case may be, 
there are some new institutions that are now coming up and courses that were offered that were never offered when I started. You know, you couldn't get a degree in business continuity management. People, you know, the first question is, <clears throat> what's business what? continuity management? You know, so <laughs> there was no doctorate, no degree, no nothing in that. And um, which is actually another finding in here that the older you are, the less chances you have mm. of actually having a degree or doctorate in business continuity. Correct. So you do run that risk. What is nice now, though, is because some of these other institutions are now offering certification courses or degrees and um, uh, different courses that, for the most part, seem to be run by some of the, you know, the baby boomers that uh, potentially leaving, that we do have a chance of mitigating that risk by bringing their experience into these courses. Now, I think that will still take a few years. You know, if someone just gets into the industry now, you know, after taking one course, I don't care if you get a certification or not, you are not knowledgeable on business continuity management. Because you're, you're, you're knowledgeable on what the book says or a book says. You're not knowledgeable <laughs> on managing, you know, different instances on the, how to deal with people and all those other aspects that come with it. You know, and thinking outside of the box. That comes later. So um, that risk, I think, will stick around for a few more years yet. But I, I'm happy to see that because there are more courses that and, and institutions offering these courses, that people will now start coming in as being a part of the industry rather than having it thrown at them at some point in their career saying, I need you to create a plan, which yeah, is what happened to most of us. <laughs> I wonder if we're sending those people up to fail because where are the entry level business continuity jobs? If you go on Indeed or Glassdoor or LinkedIn or anywhere, ZipRecruiter, I don't see many jobs that say BC junior analyst with zero to two years experience. It's all five years, 10 years, 15. Yeah. So even if someone wanted to get into our profession, I question how do they get in? Where are every other profession has kind of a ladder of here's your junior analyst, you're an analyst, a senior, you know, there's a some type of, even if it's not rigid, a methodology. Yeah. And I have, I see very often someone says, hey, do you want to be entry level BC in true in terms of true, you know, zero to two years experience. Yeah, that's true. I don't see that uh, myself. And I think that's a good point. I hadn't thought of that, uh, thought of it in that perspective. But yeah, there's not a lot of entry level stuff. You know, it's, um, you're either full on uh, or that's it. You go from zero to 60. Yep. You know, uh, but again, again, that's kind of what happens in any crisis or disaster too. <laughs> we go from zero to 60, but still that's not fair to people uh, new to the industry coming in. You know, how do we bring them on board slowly? You know, and, and, and what are their options to create that career path? You know, you can have, like I said, you can have a certification all you want, but without the experience, it's really not going to mean a lot. You know? Yeah, well, it's, it's like that's similar to any profession. Yeah, uh, you can have you can be you can have a PE, you can be, you know, certified as an engineer as uh, mm -hmm. you can have passed the bar for law school, but have never tried a case. It doesn't mean you're ready to try a case. Yeah, it's a minimal level of, of academic, you know, effort. Well, I'll use my brother as an example. He's a licensed mechanic has been for many years and is well thought of where he lives and you know what he does. And when he started, he was in a garage and he just did the simple tasks, you know, usually the grunt work, you know, was allowed to do one or two things here and there. He did that well. Okay, we'll add one more thing to it. So he actually had a path to learning to eventually okay. take his, um, uh, I don't know what they call it in the, his industry, but, you know, his exam to get his become qualified and certified, etc. Um, I don't know what it's called, but there was a path for him, you know, d to be able to do that. But to your point, it's not the same here. You can take a course, you get your, um, what, what is, I shouldn't point any out, but you get a certification if you pass the exam. Well, then what? You know, it, Indeed or Workopolis or whatever will say, uh, you know, five, 10 years experience or more, you know, and you have, and, you know, with a huge list of things you'll be responsible for, most of which, aren't in those courses to start with. 
Exactly. So if anyone in your audience comes across a job description for a business continuity position with less than five years experience, please share it. We'd love, I'd love to see it. Yeah, please uh, feel free either leave it here on the um, uh, YouTube uh, comment underneath or send it to James or myself uh, because we would, I would love to see that and, and maybe you know, help contribute how, how we can build that path because that is a gap. I think that's a, a good point you brought forward. Other things in the report that uh, stood out for you? I think it's it's all tied to that. So, you know, more than 20 years experience, 31%. 16 to 20 years, 23%. That's a cute 54% mm -hmm. of the people are 16 years, but only 3% less than less than 2 years. It's 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 not even a bell curve to me. It's just you have a lot of people with a lot of experience. And you have very few people with very little experience. There was one thing I did want to point out. Sure. The, in, in the same report that caught my attention like this, and I wish I had a pot here and, so that I could stir it right now. <laughs> <clears throat> and it was the, the most important elements for disruption planning. 35.2% uh, continual improvement of BCP through review, maintenance, ex exercise, uh, next was understanding the relationships between departments, operations, BCM, IT, DR, et cetera. Way down the list at 1.9. Do you remember what it was? I do not. Consistency in business impact analysis. 1.9. Oh, you are stirring the pot here. I like yeah, it. So correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't that one of the key, key pieces everybody keeps hammering away? <laughs> and yet it dropped right to the bottom. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the issues I've always had with BIAs is the amount of time they take to do versus the results you get. And I think management has, of any organization, has a dim view on these massive projects, regardless of the scope, that produce results that you may already know. Yeah. So I, you know, I think a lot of that is there, there is value in BIAs. Absolutely. I think they need to make sense according to the culture of the organization and regulatory constraints. But my biggest beef has always been, why do they take so long? Yeah. I, I just found it really interesting knowing <laughs> that that's always yeah. one of the big things and, you know, drop down to 1.9%. <clears throat> So less than, less than less than two percent of our peers feel BIAs are important in relation to all those other things you mentioned. So yeah, that's certainly interesting. And, and that's a big change in the, the thinking, you know, uh, yeah. of where we're going, you know, as an industry too, because that says a lot. Yeah. So, well, we've come to the end of our second segment. It's this week in business continuity with James Green, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to This Week in Business Continuity with James Green. Uh, James, there's something I've missed to mention. I meant to say it at the very, very beginning. Uh, okay. Congratulations are in order. You got a uh, certification in cybersecurity? I did. I did. Speaking of um, fish out of water, or young people, old people, uh, my, my local university, St. Petersburg College, offers a certificate in cybersecurity. You have to take six of their college classes, 18 credits. Most of my classes, I was my, the oldest classmate by far, by <laughs> far, by far. People are like, how old are you? My dad's not even that old. Um, oh, but <laughs> it was, you know, it was really around the technical aspects of network security, network defense, because just like you, I'm starting to see more cybersecurity events become crisis management events. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to have a better technical understanding of what's going on. And I think it's important that we continue to grow and learn in all aspects of life. And I'm, you know, I really think cybersecurity is just going to swallow more of risk management. So yes, I just I just completed a um a course, it took me about three, sem it was three semesters, so two classes a semester for three semesters. I have my now official certificate 
So I'm uh, just dangerous enough to barely know what I'm talking <laughs> about, I think. Well, congratulations on that. <laughs> Thank you. And I, actually, I've been looking for some sort of a cyber course up this way too now, um, knowing mostly because of talking with you, knowing that, you know, where things might be going. I thought, you know, I, I should really look into that too. So, yeah, and all of mine was <laughs> online, which was important because... Uh, I, I have a job. I have a family. I'm not an 18 year old freshman. I need to be able to take classes when I can or at weird times or, um, so I was thankful that, and especially during a pandemic, everything went online anyways. So that worked out in that respect, worked out well for me. Well, it's just to take a point, uh, further on that, um, with weird hours, I just took a course, uh, a certification course for organizational resilience. Um, based in India, which was, I don't know if you know, Daman Sood. Um, he's been on uh, LinkedIn quite a bit lately and uh, talked yes. to him a few times. So I took his inaugural course on organizational resilience specialist and implementer. <laughs> and because of the time zone where I am, I was actually in school at 1230 AM <laughs> <laughs> for a few days, uh, you know, nonstop for what, yeah. nine hours or something. Oh, wow. Uh, oh boy. Let me tell you, that really hits you. That's tough. Oh, yeah. But back to our stuff here. Uh, th the next thing I wanted to touch on, um, and I know I added this kind of late, but this, is, uh, this has been showing up in the news quite a bit lately. And even right now, as we talk, um, there is a, a joint base in San Antonio, Texas on lockdown due to active shooter. With the number of active shooter events that are occurring, um, not just in the United States, uh, I'm not, I don't want to point a finger in, in, at anyone, because we've had a couple up here in Canada now, mm -hmm. and you're seeing them in other parts of the world. Is this something we, not just the cyber stuff, but and the other items, but something else organizations and communities in general now need, should start considering some sort of preparedness, planning, investigation, something to do Look at look, by looking at active shooter events. Yes, absolutely. So I actually started training organizations on active shooters in the workplace in 2014. And at that time, uh, people didn't understand why it was a topic I was speaking about and training people about and passionate about. And unfortunately, it grew year over year. And I think over the last year and a half, people have kind of forgotten about that aspect of workplace violence because the locations where those events traditionally happen have been remote, have been people working from home. So that, that conversation has gone quiet. But like you said, the last couple of months, we've seen a lot of incidents. And I think we've, we're just seeing more violence Unfortunately, in general, if you look at what happened on a Southwest Airlines flight a few weeks ago where someone assaulted or punched a flight attendant, we are um, a very angry society right now. Uh, I was trying to think, you know, earlier today, explaining to my kids that I don't think Americans have been this angry internally since the Vietnam War. And so you have a lot of factors kind of stoking those flames. You have um, a, a president in the United States and, you know, and, and leaders in other countries who are maybe leading with inflammatory language. You have a pandemic that I think the long term mental health consequences are going to be interesting to study people. You always hear that people are social creatures they weren't meant to be locked in a house for a year. Um, and then I've noticed as we were all social distancing for so long, getting back out into society is maybe unfamiliar and feels different. And I just feel there's this, there's a lot of tension right below the surface that is going to bubble up like it is today in Texas, like it did on the Southwest airlines flight, mm -hmm. like it's going to continue to do where you and I talked the last time about people leaving the service profession or transitioning in and out of professions. Unfortunately, those things are going to continue to manifest themselves into 
workplace violence because wherever these issues happened, it's somebody's workplace. Mm -hmm. And it always ties back to business continuity for me, because if your office is closed for a police investigation or an aspect of, of violence, that's a business interruption. Your office is now closed and you have legal ramifications and you have a trauma with your employees or survivors or victims. Um, so I definitely think it's, it's something that organizations, I think started to take, you know, based on anecdotally, people were really taking that serious. I got a lot of requests for training information, 2018, 2019, and then it stopped, but I don't think it went away. I think it just paused because of the pandemic. And unfortunately, I think it's going to unpause and, and continue to, to occur. Yeah, I, I think uh, some of the existing issues uh, that people had were always there and they're, they're underneath like an undercurrent, but they've put the pandemic on top where you say, you know, the, the social aspects of being a person have been restricted or taken away altogether simply because of the pandemic, not because somebody's forcing someone to do things. But after a year and a half of that, that in itself is already impacting people. Now you add that with any underlying uh, concerns or issues a, a person or a group may have had, and the tolerance for anything now is shorter. You know, everyone's got yeah. a shorter fuse. You know, something that may never have bothered you before or may have just been a small irritant suddenly is exaggerated to be a huge issue. And now we're ending up with these uh, incidents across the globe. I know there's been some in Europe recently. Um, you know, uh, in, in um, France, unfortunately, it seems to have had quite a few. Um, we've had a couple in Canada, one just, you know, an hour and a half west of me where a person ran through a, uh, drove through an intersection, killing four members of a family, you know, out of anger uh, and, you know, other instances all across you know, the world. And the pandemic just seems to have made everyone angrier. You know, yeah. you can be angry. You know, I, I get angry at my government all the time, you know, but that's natural. It doesn't matter who's in power. You're going to get angry with them. But now people are taking that anger compounded with everything else that they've experienced and are, they don't have an outlet for that anger anymore. They're, they're releasing it in different ways, in dangerous ways now. Yeah. I'm and not as, a psychologist, so. You know, no, but as people return back to offices or normal life, those incidents of workplace violence are going to increase. To me, active shooter is just the most extreme form of workplace violence, but I think we're going to see an uptick in other forms of, all forms of workplace violence, unfortunately. Any tips? I'll just ask you, any tips that organizations might want to consider looking at right away to, in, in anticipation of people coming back to the office? I think it's like any other emerging risk. You don't want to ignore it. You plan for scenarios. It doesn't mean you have to focus on them. You don't have to scare your employees. But kind of the, one of the tips I do is when I come into a company and they're apprehensive about discussing it with their employees, I say, well, do you do fire drills? Yeah. Do you tell employees that they may trap in a door and burn to death and all the gruesome things? No. Okay. Why? This is a similar life safety issue. You train for and create awareness around tornadoes or fires or whatever the most relevant risks are. This is just another aspect mm -hmm. of life safety in your organization. And that's how you should present it to your employees with the caveat that if you don't do anything for life safety now, if your company's never had a fire drill, never had a shelter in place drill, never had a tornado drill, if you lead with active shooter training, you will scare all of your employees. You have to be doing all aspects of life safety so that people just see it as part of, you know, the system of safety and protection that we have here at this organization. Yeah, you don't want to get to a point where you've scared your employees, they don't want to come to the office anymore. Correct. And worse that, you know, they're looking at sideways at the person they sit beside as a potential threat. Exactly. You, know, you, you just don't want your, your, you know, your morale is going to go down. You know, people's productivity is going to go down. And then you've got a different kind of crisis going on when you could have uh, mitigated by simply being helpful and creating a sense of awareness.
you know. So we're getting to the end of our, our show. Now, okay. we, we said we'd uh, share, you know, some of the things we're working on or reading or doing right now. So um, I'll go first. All right. Um, it's been a really busy week for me, uh, quite busy. I've been reading all kinds of reports, the two that we, uh, the one that we talked about and um, the BCP compensation report, other ones that have uh, come out recently, including the uh, Bank of England operational resilience stuff. Nice yeah. light reading, yeah. Yeah, light reading, that's for sure. Um, for fun, I've, I read the uh, Gary Newman Revolution autobiography. Nice. For those, for those that don't remember, Gary Newman is the guy who sang Cars from 1980. Uh, I've been listening to him since 79. And for learning, I'm reading Awake at Work, Personal Learning. Oh, nice. And uh, for work, work learning, um, Harvard Business Reviews, Organizational Resilience Essays. Oh, and nice. Really some interesting stuff in here, that's for sure. And... I'm not done. I've, <laughs> my, <laughs> it's been, like I said, it's been a busy week. It's going to be a busy week. This is just a quick outline, uh, 20 pages of my next book that I'm writing. I've already started writing that. And for the first time, it's not out yet. It won't be out yet for a while because I still have to do the proof. But my next book, is, the proof is now ready, planning and performing the business impact assessment, which is why I pointed out the one, the the topic I did earlier, the cost, so the challenges, and the considerations, all the things that we talked about, are in here. You're probably not going to have that 1.9 percent graphic no, that's not in, in your book. That's it. I'm sending you a copy on this because we talked about it. So I said I'd. Send yes, it. Yeah. absolutely. But Thank this weekend, you. This weekend, I've got to go through and uh, you know find anything that needs to be changed. So that's uh, that's what I've been up to in the last little while. I'm That's like, more no. than me. I just have one book, a light read, Go Like Hell. Uh, if anyone is familiar with the book Ford versus Ferrari uh, about the, you know, Henry Ford II's dream or desire to win the 24 Hours of Le Mans, that's actually a true story and is based on this book. So fun read, very interesting um, dynamic between Henry Ford in the U.S. and Enzo Ferrari in Italy and stereotypes about Americans and stereotypes about Italians and some of the myopic views of car manufacturers. I was born and raised in Detroit, so I'm partial to any car story. Mm. So this has been this has been a good, good, quick read. See, I bet people think that, you know, the, these disaster guys, they probably just read about nothing but disaster. <laughs> We've got a wide variety of stuff here. Yes. So the last little bit, I told James I was going to do this uh, today as something fun because we talk about serious subjects. You know, we just talked about active shooters and things. And uh, I'm going to have a lightning round with James. He has five, five to ten seconds to answer or right away uh, about five or six questions here. And we'll just get uh, get a little bit to know uh, James, uh, you know, a bit more. So you ready? James? I'm, 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 this is where legal and my publicist are nervous. So yeah, let's go. <laughs> Cruise lines and COVID, travel <clears throat> or no travel? This year, no travel. Tokyo Olympics, go ahead or not? Uh, it's going to go ahead because of the money involved, but I'd, I think it should not go ahead. You've got a lot of athletes who are not interested. A lot of the Japanese major media companies are saying, don't do this. I think there's so much money involved with the TV rights, the networks, BBC, NBC. They're not going to give that money back, so it's going to happen. Travel restrictions, should be they lifted or not? If you are vaccinated, travel. Dogs or cats? Cats. Oh, I can't believe I said that. Uh, that's another story. I'll tell you that one. But now it's cats. Uh, dogs at this end, just for the record. <laughs> this, is, this will be a fun one. Potato chips or Cheetos? Potato chips. More variety. <laughs> I'm just going back to some of those postings <laughs> you put on LinkedIn with those pictures. And the last one. The Tampa Bay Lightning should play who in the next round? Yes. Yeah, so my Tampa Bay Lightning, I call them mine, like I play on the team, um, advance to the next round. 
last night we will play the winner of the Boston Bruins New York Islanders series game six they're three two I'm gonna go Boston Bruins because we faced we again we faced the Islanders in the conference finals last year I think and I think it's harder to um, compete against an opponent a second time they're gonna want to get to the cup so I would say I would say the Bruins Great. That's all the questions I had for you this time. <laughs> now, having said that, the next time we talk, if the Bruins have swept the Lightning, I will have completely <laughs> my answer. Well, you know, for th the last two episodes, I kept make, saying that the Leafs were going to go forward, and, well, they didn't <clears throat> again. 0-8 oh uh, in clinching games. That's tough. Uh, they're just terrible with that. But <laughs> the good news on that uh, same weekend that they lost, my favorite footy team, um, Chelsea Blues, in London won the European Championship. So they did. Congratulations! Not a good, a good, uh, good news story out of that. So excellent. So, so James, we've come to the end of another this week in business continuity. It's been a blast. Yeah, actually, this one the, uh, you can obviously tell we're opening up a little bit more and having a lot more fun <laughs> with this. You know, which is good because this is exactly where I wanted these episodes to go. I'm bringing more props next time. I'm <laughs> letting you know. So. Well, I, I shouldn't have any. You know, I should just be working on my book if I'm if I'm if I'm a good boy. If I follow what I said I would do. So, but thanks again for sharing your time and expertise. Any actually any final thoughts or comments you want to pass along before we uh, go? Uh, coming into to summer, a lot of people are going to be traveling. Be you know situationally aware. Be safe out there, but have fun. On that note, we've come to the end of another This Week in Business Continuity. James, thanks very much again for your time and expertise. And to everyone watching, stay prepared, everybody. If you liked that video, thumbs up. If you didn't like that video, thumbs down. But leave a message and let me know what your thoughts are. If you'd like to be a guest on the show to talk about something related to business continuity, disaster management, COVID, personal well-being, anything that's relatable to those subjects, you can reach me through my LinkedIn profile, which is in the video description. And of course, don't forget to subscribe. In the meantime, stay prepared, everybody.